Ahang bante ti sarnena saha pancha silan yat kami dutiampi ahang bante ti sarnena saha pancha silan yat kami tatiampi ahang bante ti sarnena saha pancha silan yat kami Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa 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 Buddhang saranam gacchami Buddhang saranam gacchami Dhammang saranam gacchami Dhammang saranam gacchami Sanghang saranam gacchami Sanghang saranam gacchami Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi budhang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi budhang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Ti sarana gamana ti tang. Ama bante. Pana ti pata viraman. Ha padam samadhi rami. Pana ti pata viramani sikha padam samadhi rami. Adinna dana viraman. Ha padam samadhi rami. Adinna dana veramani sikha padang samadhi yami. Kami su nichaha chara veramani sikha padang samadhi yami. Kami su nichaha chara veramani sikha padang samadhi yami. Musavada veramani sikha padang samadhi yami. Musa Vada Veramani Sikha Padang Samadhi Yami Sura Miraya Manjapamada Thana Veramani Sikha Padang Samadhi Yami Sura Miraya Manjapamada Thana Veramani Sikha Padang Samadhi Yami Imani Pancha Sikha Padani Si day na sukating yanti, si day na boga sampada, si day na nibuting yanti, tasma si lang so dahi. Sadu, 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 sadu. 142. The Kina Nibanga Sutta, the exposition of offerings. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in the Shakyan country at Kapilvattu in Niroda's park. Then Mahapajapati Gautami took a new pair of clothes and went to the Buddha. Note 1291 Mahapajapati Gautama was the younger sister of Queen Mahamaya, the Buddha's mother, and was also wife of King Suddhodana. After Mahamaya's death, she became the Buddha's foster mother. The present sutta takes place at an early point in Buddha's ministry 
on one of his return visits to his native city. After King Suryodana's death, Mahapajapati pleaded with the Buddha to admit women into the Sangha and her acceptance marked the beginning of the Bhikkhuni Sangha. The order of non the story is found in uh, Vin C B K H ten two fifty three dash five dash six C Jnana Amolis The Life of the Buddha Paragraph one oh four dash seven. So I'll explain why not because the, the the next paragraph he's going to discuss something that's really invalid in my opinion. So I'm going to ask that we just omit it. It's invalid because it calls into question this text, and this is apparently a um, a view that has arisen among at least this group of particular monks that he mentions. And they contacted. I was in contact with them a long time ago about this. And it was uh, evidence that the suttas are being tampered with, or ha- not, not are being were t- were tampered with, were uh, altered, and what we have now is is sort of an edit- editorialized version, or a, maybe a a changed version, or something. And it's certainly possible that change occurred. We 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 don't have any proof that it didn't. It's not. It's not possible for us to to prove or to show that they are exactly the first of all the words of the buddha and second of all an accurate depiction of of what happened surrounding those words but this sutta isn't a good example of that and this is this sutta is used as an example because the buddha mentions the bhikkhuni sangha and he's, he mentions it before the bhikkhuni sangha exists and so that's thought to be some kind of proof or evidence that um, that, that's, that the suttas are changed. I mean, it's quite a leap to make that assumption in the first place. But in the second place, this isn't the only place that the Buddha has mentioned the Bhikkhuni Sangha before the Bhikkhuni Sangha existed. And the, the, the mo- most obvious one is right after the Buddha was enlightened. Right after he became Buddha, he mentions the Mara asks him or, or invites him to not teach. Uh, what happens is he's invited to teach. Brahma comes and says, "Look, uh, the people with aparajika jatika. We, we mentioned this, right? They have little dust in their eyes, so teach for their benefit." And then Mara comes and says, "No, no, don't teach. Uh, just be at be at, be at peace yourself, because he's worried. Mara's worried that if the Buddha teaches, then other people will stop creating things." Stop getting caught up in in excitement, which of course is the bread and butter of the Maras. They delight in the creations of others. And so Mara says, oh, don't teach. And the Buddha says, I made a the Buddha said, I made I, I make a vow that I will not pass away before the bhikkhus and the bhikkhunis. And the lay disciples, male lay disciples, female lay disciples, these four groups, which comprise the Buddha, the Buddha, Parisa, the following of the Buddha, until they are all able to practice and spread the teaching on their own. So the, 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 the mention of it here, my guess is as a hint to uh, go to me to think about becoming a bhikkhuni. I mean, the fact that he mentions it here to the person who is going to become the first bhikkhuni has real importance, actually. It's not an anachronism, as they say, or an an error in the text. It's on purpose. He doesn't mention it to other people, but he mentions it to her because he knows what's going to happen. And he's he's, uh, pushing for it without actually appearing to push for it because his, he has ret- he, he presents reticence or what appears to be reticence he, he's he's reluctant or he appears reluctant to ordain uh, uh, simply as a means to i mean we would explain it as a means to caution and to temper people's excitement about something very sort of new and 
and unique the ordin ordination of well that's not fair to say there were women had left the home life and and lived with other sects but the buddha was the first teacher to claim that women could become fully enlightened there was a general belief that women were inferior and couldn't didn't have the same faculties as men and so the other religions were saying women could only become angels in heaven at best but could not become enlightened um but uh, allowing them to ordain was uh, instigated by uh, Mahaprajapati Gautami. And I would say this sutta that was a part of that, rather than saying that there's some problem. Anyway, it's not really related to the sutta. I just thought, given that they're actually boldly coming out and suggesting this, I thought I would pose my disagreement with that, that line of thought. So, Bhante, I, I heard that uh, the first time uh, Buddha refused to ordain Mahapajapati and Ananda had to step in and uh, persuade him, right? Yes. The, the Buddha didn't actually refuse. He, uh, well, he refused up until the third time. He, uh... And also, is that true? Then, uh, uh, then after Buddha uh, ordained, like, you know, Bhikkhuni, he also made a statement that uh, his Tama will now uh, doesn't last uh, for 4,000 and it will go down to 500 years, something like that. I, so he, the, the, yes, but the statement is uh, that that would have happened and as a result, he instated some fairly severe um, restrictions or requirements. And he called them heavy requirements or heavy rules that the bhikkhunis had to follow. I mean, it was mainly sort of requiring them to be uh, dependent in some ways on the bhikkhus so that they would not just start their own group. Because because of the separation between women and men, the, 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 the use of ordination is in a large part due to the segregation, the separation from objects of lust, I mean, celibacy. And because of the predominantly heterosexual population, staying away from women is an integral part of that, staying away from the opposite gender. And so having uh, women come made it hard because of the imposed separation to instruct them. And you can't live by example when the person you're living by example has to has to stay at arm's length from you. And so whether it was perfect or not perfect, it, it was a, these measures were put in place to kind of allow that to happen. So you've got these new bhikkhunis who are going to come, how can they learn from the bhikkhus? Well, let's be clear that they have to uh, at once stay separate, but also live under like like uh, under meaning live as students as as uh, trainees and so yeah there were some severe and and the commentary explains that because of those serious uh, rules that there would be no uh, no decline of Buddha Sasana as a result but um, the the more important point here for me was was the critic the accusation of of editorializing of of altering the text. And this sutta is not a good example of that. If you want to find another example, this is the only example I've ever heard, is this sutta is evidence of tampering. I mean, apart from speculation, and it's it's not good evidence at all. And so the reason, biggest reason for bringing it up was just to point out how, how in my mind, frivolous some of these claims are and baseless they are and and how also how easy it is to um, fall prey to this sort of speculation when it agrees with your um, sort of skeptical nature of doubting everything of uh, not being able to put your trust in something so as a result you you get suspicious I mean, it's fine to to accept that 
we don't know if any of this actually happened. We don't know for sure because it's all Ewa I, I this is thus have I heard. But when you fall prey to this sort of suspicion, it really takes away some of the ability. It takes away your ability to appreciate when you do know something. Like doubt is pernicious or harmful, most most especially because of how it it makes you forget the confidence you gain or the the uh, appreciation you gain through experience. So when you gain confidence in something through seeing it work, uh, I mean, this is very powerful and helpful and supportive. And doubt as a habit makes you forget that and say, but did I really? Is it really? It's It's like all the hindrances. They don't, you can't just doubt things that are worth doubting. You can't just doubt when you have no evidence. If you have doubt as a habit, you will also doubt when you have evidence. And you will, it will make you forget and it will cloud the mind to uh, render impotent the, uh, the, the confidence and the, the evidence that you do have. So um, these kind of attitudes of suspicion that uh, this is a, an example in my mind of where it goes goes overboard and this analytical nature where people analyze and think about things uh, can really be a detriment and and harmful in this case i mean it leaves open this accusation of of tampering and though that may have happened this is not good evidence uh, really disappointing when a translator doesn't stick to his job seriously the, you, the difference between that first paragraph and the second paragraph that, that's editorializing by the by the translator I, 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 so don't read that <laughs> we, we, we won't we won't be negative or you know, let's not stray into that but we won't read that part we'll cut we'll tear off the part we we won't use and keep the good part like when monks get rag robes they only keep the part that's not rotten and the buddha said Focus on what's good. That's the problem. When, when some friends ask me, do you know a good English uh, translation or uh, a monk who uh, gives good uh, sermons in English? I just, I only have a, uh, you to recommend, but <laughs> I can't even recommend uh, big body sermons without even listening to them first. It's like, um, uh, yeah. Sometimes I uh, have to do uh, some homework before recommending something. <laughs> Can't just recommend this by, uh, okay, this is big Bodhis translation. <laughs> Maybe I should yeah, use. I, I appreciate, I mean, he's a great translator, but there's a difference between translation ability and wisdom. I mean, it, wisdom in, in the sense that we think about it, uh, uh, Sometimes monks or, or people can be more focused on what we would call worldly perspectives. And it, it's really a, a, a difference of perspective. Unless someone is focused or, or looking at things from the perspective of meditation, well, not meditation, but ultimate reality, let's say, experience and they're going to have different perspectives because they're a monk or a translator. Does it mean they have that perspective of looking at things sort of without editorializing? After paying homage to him, she sat down at one side and said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, this new pair of cloths has been spun by me woven by me, especially for the Blessed One. Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One accept it from me out of compassion. When this was said, the Blessed One told her, Give it to the Sangha, go to me. When you give it to the Sangha, both I and the Sangha will be honored. Note uh, 1292 MA The Buddha asked her to give the gift to the Sangha because he wanted her volition of generosity to be directed both to the Sangha and to himself, as the combined volition would yield merit 
conducive to her welfare and happiness for a long time to come. He also said this so that later generations would be inspired to show respect towards the Sangha and by supporting the Sangha with the four physical requisites would contribute towards the longevity of the dispensation. Yeah, something that's not mentioned there and not really made explicit in the sutta, but I think is important as we read through it to keep in mind the um, the attachment to persons can hinder or get in the way of the power of of uh, well the power of of goodness. I mean, the sutta is it's not very deep in in practical. Uh, teachings on on the path to enlightenment it's just a, it's very practical but it's practical about giving which is a fairly sort of basic and non-core teaching of the buddha in some ways i mean the buddha taught it it's one of the things the buddha taught but put it in a place of sort of um, uh, ancillary or sort of a supportive practices like it's very supportive to be kind and generous and if you're not it's going to be a real hindrance on your path but it is not the path to enlightenment to give but one important thing that does relate very much to the path is is again this attachment to persons attachment to to self and attachment to the people and so remember, this is the Buddha's aunt and stepmother and a very close relative and someone who likely had some attachments to the Buddha going in. And so a deeper and more powerful teaching than just talking about what is what sort of giving gives better result is is why it gives better result. Because the Sangha is 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 the idea of enlightenment. What is the Sangha? The Sangha is, and the basis of the Sangha is enlightenment. It's uh, those who are enlightened or those who are protecting and maintaining and carrying on this, this teaching. It's, it's abstract and it's, it's a focus on uh, qualities rather than people, because again, focusing on people, potential for attachment in general for anyone is going to be higher, but especially for Gotami, who's quite likely has some attachment, and there's quite good reason to suspect that that's why the Buddha uh, gave this teaching to her and, and didn't mention this to absolutely everyone. But here's here's this the, his aunt giving him giving her nephew a robe, right? And he's pointing out that. Though it may not be the case here, I mean, it may be that her intentions are pure. First of all, in general, as I said, that that's going to be an issue. But also, this is going to be a question. Oh, the aunt gave to the nephew. Did she really have uh, a pure mind, or was it just? Can we just dismiss this gift that she gave, even though she weaved it herself and was very loving and and consider it to give it to him did she just do it out of love for a nephew as opposed to out of appreciation for the buddha uh, both are both are i think relevant i don't know what the exact case of her mind when she gave was but it certainly is a good teaching and, and a, a deeper teaching than just about what giving gives better result and to talk about why is it why would it be that giving to the sangha that is is better than giving to the supreme being, our teacher. Why you, know, you should give to your teacher, shouldn't you? But no, if the it shows the difference between concepts and reality, because conceptually, there's nothing better than the Buddha. So of course, conceptually, giving to the Buddha, you would think would be better. In the Sangha, well, it's um, in some ways even a little abstract, so hard to cling to. But uh, from a point of view of ultimate reality, it's more fruitful because of the focus of the mind. There's no connection made to an individual. Like when you give to your teacher something, maybe you also are kind of partial to that person. And that's not wholesome. That's not healthy. I mean, it's not as powerful 
as giving to something that doesn't let you cling like like the sangha. It's not as easy to cling to the sangha, and so your effort, your intentions are pure, more pure, generally speaking. A second time and a third time, she said to the blessed one, "Venerable sir, accept it from me out of compassion." A second time and a third time, the blessed one told her, "Give it to the sangha, Gautami." When you give to the Sangha, both I and the Sangha will be honored. Then the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One accept the new pair of clothes from Mahapajapati Gautami. Mahapajapati Gautami has been very helpful to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir. As his mother's sister, she was his nurse, his foster mother. the one who gave him milk she suckled the blessed one when his own mother died the blessed one too has been very helpful to mahapajapati gautami venerable sir it is owing to the blessed one that mahapajapati gautami has gone for refuge to the buddha the dhamma and the sangha it is owing to the blessed one that mahapajapati gautami abstains from killing living beings from taking what is not given from misconduct in sensual pleasures from from false speech from and from uh, wine liquor and intoxicants which are the basis of negligence it is owing to the blessed one that mahapajapati gautami possesses unwavering confidence in the buddha the dhamma and the sangha and that she possesses the virtues loved by the noble ones note 1293 says these are the four factors of stream entry thus it is clear that at the time the sutta takes place mahapajapati gautami is already a stream enterer end of note it is owing to the blessed one that mahapajapati gautami is free from doubt about suffering about the origin of suffering about the cessation of suffering and about the way leading to the cessation of suffering the blessed one has been very helpful to mahapajapati gautami that is so ananda that is so when one person hoin to another one has gone for refuge to the buddha the dhamma and the sangha i said that this is not easy for the former to repay the latter by paying homage to him rising up for him according to his reverent reverential salutation and polite mm-hmm. service by providing robe and food resting place and medicinal requi- requisites when one person owing to another one has come to abstain from killing living being from taking what is not given from misconduct in sensual pre- pleasure from false speech and from wine liquor and intoxicant which are the basis of negligence i said that it is not easy for the former to repay the latter by paying homage to him and medicinal requirement requisites when one person owing to another has come to possess unwavering confidence in the buddha the dhamma and the sangha and to possess the virtues loved by noble ones i say that it is not easy for the former to repay the latter by paying homage to him and medical requisites when one person owing to another has become free from doubt about suffering about the origin of suffering about the cessation of suffering and about the way leading to the cessation of suffering i say that it is not easy for the former to repay the latter by paying homage to him and medical requisites there are 14 kinds of personal offerings ananda note 1294 the buddha undertakes this teaching because the sutta began with a personal gift presented to him and he wishes to make clear the comparative value of personal gifts and gifts offered to the sangha one gives a gift to the tathagata accomplished and fully enlightened this is the first kind of personal offering one gives a gift to a pacheka buddha this is the second kind of personal offering one gives a gift to an arahant this arahant disciple of the tathagata this is the third kind of personal offering one gives a gift to one who has entered upon the way to the realization of 
fruit of the fruit of arahanship. This is the fourth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to a non-returner. This is the fifth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of non-return. This is the sixth kind of personal off offering. One gives a gift to a once returner. This is the seventh kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of one's return. This is the eighth, eighth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to a stream enterer. This is the ninth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of stream entry. Note 1295. MA and MT explain this, that this term can be loosely extended to include even a lay follower who has gone for refuge to the triple gem, as well as lay people and monks intent on fulfilling the moral training and practice of concentration and insight. In the strict technical sense, it refers only to those possessing the supramundane path of stream entry. This is the tenth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to one outside the dispensation who is free from lust for sensual pleasures. Note 1296. This is a non-Buddhist contemplative who attains the jhanas and the mundane kinds of direct knowledge. This is the eleventh kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to a virtuous ordinary person. This is the twelfth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to an immoral or ordinary person. This is the thirteenth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to an animal. This is the fourteenth kind of personal offering. Okay, so um, the, the persons who are just uh, entered... Uh, where uh, who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of uh, whichever path. Um, so they are just uh, referring to lay people, basically, and not bhikkhus, right? Well, it doesn't discriminate. But added. then, what's but then what's the difference? Uh, uh, what's the difference between one who is already, a, let's say, a stream enterer? And one who has entered upon the way to the realization. So the, the commentary mentions that this can be uh, can be applied to people who are on what we call the Pubanga Maga, who have okay. undertaken the practices of Sila Samadhi Panya, but, ha but not the technical Arya Maga, which is just one moment. Uh, Arya Maga is the first moment of, of realization of Nibbana. So there, there are, so, okay, so for the Pubanga Maga, uh, it's not necessary, right? So they can be um, enlightened ones as well, because it, uh, it says also for the Sakadagami and the Anagami, yeah, there is a no, they're not. Well, so the person who is on the path on the Pubanga Maga for Sotapanna is not in light. Yes. It's still, so that's everyone. But for who the Sakadaga. The well, they're already a Sotapanna. But it, mm -hmm. but it says, um, for example, so one gives a gift to one ha who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of one's return. This is the eighth kind of person offering, and it says the same thing for the non-return as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, technically, that is possible, right? It's a one moment. Let's say somebody is meditating, and you place a no, gift in front no, of the that, person. No, no, that's not possible. No, that's not what this means. This means someone who is on the Pubanga Maga for for uh, for Sakatagami. Yes. Okay. For Anagami. Training. Sotapanna so, who is training to become a, a second again. So it is a Sotapanna who is not training versus one who is training. Yeah. If they're training uh -huh. for a second 
then that's uh, i mean this is this is giving to people right this is an ultimate reality this is this oh yeah is conceptual yeah, but I wanted to understand the cons the, the what is meant behind this concept, Pante. Yeah, the commentary says it it can be applied to people who are practicing on the way, not not just that one moment. So does it mean it's only possible for Sotapanna to be on the way to Sakadagami and not yes. for Arahant? Because it's always one step. Yes. One step. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Just one so, question. Yes. Uh, so this paragraph is, seems to be ranking the gifts that one can give. So in a way, doesn't it contradict the theme of the Sutta that uh, the Buddha says that uh, his and it's better for her to give to the Sangha and the Buddha than just the Buddha. But he says that the first kind of gift is to give it to the Buddha. Well, he's going to say later that the, the Sangha is even better to give to. Yeah, the Buddha started with this, according to the note, uh, because uh, uh, Mahapajapati Gautami wanted to give a personal gift. So you start with that topic and then you go to the others. I mean, the, the whole point is, you hear, how, you hear how good it is to give to the Buddha? Well, guess what? It's even better than that. The amazing thing is that even how great that is, it's greater to give, still greater to give to the Sangha. That's the amazing thing. Yeah. That's um, the whole I'm... point is to build up and say how great it is, you know, how inconceivably great it is to give something to a Buddha. Wow. But it's still better to give to the Sangha. It seems like it would expose, like, let's say that I'm a lay person and I'm preoccupied with, I want to give to these people for this reason. Um, it it seems like it would expose even more like a side of of um, like greed, I guess, that I might still be carrying while I'm on the path. That's what comes to mind as I listen to this. Yeah, that, that's the idea again. With conceptually, it it's hard to understand why giving to the Buddha isn't the best, but practically speaking and experientially. Your fixation on a person is is not doing any favors. I mean, we are speaking about the foster mom, mother, right? Like uh, mm -hmm. of the Buddha, so she yeah. probably has uh, attachment. Yeah, but and what Ananda um, seems to not not have seen. Ananda had some, some yeah. Uh, yeah, he he's very kind and thoughtful, but. Who didn't have the wisdom of the Buddha, I don't think. He he also has the attachments uh, to his cousin, right? The Buddha. Potentially, yeah. So even even conceptually, Bhante, when he is when giving a gift to the Sangha, it includes the Buddha, right? So it is Buddha and yeah. the Sangha. So yeah, even but then it's harder it works. to harder to cling to that. I think is I think it's a part of it that it's harder to cling to. Um, what what I understand from this is that um, if you really want to contribute uh, to preserving the Dharma and the teaching, uh, you should not focus on one person, but the but the whole institute, basically, right? So well, you could even generalize it. Sorry to interrupt, but you could even generalize it more to say don't focus on concepts, right? That's that's what the the narrative. That's what the the idea behind this is, which is important, not just for giving, but for practice and enlightenment as well. Sorry, go ahead. But Bante, the, uh, saying that don't focus on the concept to a normal putujana or someone that just, you know, they are just giving. Um, I, I mean, I don't see how they could understand that. Well, that's why you don't. I mean, that's why he didn't. He instead said, give to the Sangha without explaining it in deep detail like that but it's uh it's it's a it's sort of the 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 uh, pattern the buddha doing things like this and realigning people helping people to realign their efforts in ways that are more uh, fruitful 
Uh, Bhante, is it rare that the Buddha accepted gifts? Uh, because I remember like he many times um, declined robes. Um, I don't know how many times he declined robes, but I would say it's not so common for him to decline offerings. I mean, I think he would have accepted it if it was if it was it was if she was stubborn about it but oh. uh he didn't he doesn't reject it here he just redirects or tells her to do something different with it so initially declining the declining the gift that gives an opportunity to give this uh, sermon this sutta he doesn't decline it I mean, he tells her does he he doesn't literally say no yeah and that's a very that's a pattern as well often this is an important point that I try to make clear, don't put words in the Buddha's mouth, right? He didn't decline it. And that's a common thing where we say the Buddha, the Buddha refused or the Buddha said no, but he didn't, right? Um, the Buddha, like we're talking about the bhikkhunis, be careful to read exactly what the Buddha said and get the sense that often he's trying to appear to say something without actually saying it or not even trying, but it appears to be said, but but the wording is very particular, and that gives us a hint of what the actual meaning is, or or the limitations of the statement. If the Buddha isn't telling her no; he's just um, advising her as his aunt, because that's a part of that's one of the Buddha's uh, duties. What that the Buddha undertakes after enlightenment is the care of their relatives, just as we all to some extent, should appreciate the importance of our relatives. Okay, six. Herein Ananda, by giving a gift to an animal, the offering may be expected to repay a hundredfold. Note 1297 MA, in a hundred existence, it gives long life, beauty, happiness, strength, and intelligence. And it makes one free of agitation. The following attainments should be understood accordingly. By giving a gift to an immoral, ordinary person, the offering may be expected to repay a thousandfold. By giving a gift to a vir virtuous, ordinary person, the offering may be expected to repay a hundred thousandfold. By giving a gift to one outside the dispensation who is free from lust from, for sensual pleasures, the offering may be expected to repay a hundred thousand times a hundred thousand fold. By giving a gift to the one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of stream entry, the offering may be expected to repay incalculably, immeasurably. What then should be said about a giving a gift to a stream enterer? What should be said about giving a gift to the one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of one's return? To a once returner? To one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of non return? To a non returner? To one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of arahantship? To an arahant? To a Pacheka Buddha? which should be said about giving a gift to a Tathagata, accomplished and fully enlightened. 1298. M.A. says that although the results of giving in each of these cases is incalculable, there is still an ascending gradation in their incalculability, similar to the ascending incalculability of the waters in a great river, etc., up to that of the waters in the ocean. Perhaps the incalculable, immeasurable value of these gifts consists in their becoming a supporting condition for attainment of the paths, fruits, and the bottom. There are seven kinds of offerings made to the Sangha Ananda. One gives a gift to a Sangha of both bhikkhus and bhikkhunis headed by the Buddha. This is the first kind of offering made to the Sangha. Note 1299. M.A. There is no gift equal in measure to this gift. This is the kind of gift offering the pair of cloths to the Sangha. One gives 
a gift to a Sangha of both bhikkhus and bhikkhunis after the Tathagata has attained final Nibbana. This is the second kind of offering made to the Sangha. One gives a gift to a Sangha of bhikkhus. This is the third kind of offering made to the Sangha. One gives a gift to a Sangha of bhikkhunis. This is the fourth kind of offering made to the Sangha. One gives a gift saying, Appoint so many bhikkhus and bhikkhunis for me from the Sangha. This is the fifth kind of offering made to the Sangha. One gives a gift saying, Appoint so many bhikkhus for me from the Sangha. This is the sixth kind of offering made to the Sangha. One gives a gift saying, Appoint so many bhikkhunis for me from the Sangha. This is the seventh kind of offering made to the Sangha. In the future times, Ananda, uh, there will be members of the clan who are yellow necks, immoral, of evil character. Note 1300. MA, members of the clan, Gotrabuno, are those who are monks merely in name. They will go about with a piece of yellow cloth tied around their necks or arms and will support their wives and children by engaging in trade and farming, etc. End of note. People will give gifts to those immoral persons for the sake of the Sangha. Even then, I say, an offering made to the Sangha is incalculable, immeasurable. Note um, 1301. The gift is incalculable and immeasurable in value because it is offered by way of the intention of the donor, not to the yellow necks as individuals, but to the Sangha as a corporate whole. Thus the recipient body includes all the virtuous bhikkhus of the past, even those who have long passed away. End of note. And I say that in no way is a gift to a person individually even more fruitful than an offering made to the Sangha. Note 1302. M.A. states that a gift offered to an immoral bhikkhu taken to represent the entire Sangha is more fruitful than a gift offered on a personal basis to an arahant. But for the gift, to be properly presented to the Sangha, the donor must take no account of the personal qualities of the recipient, but must see him solely as representing the Sangha as a whole. Just a uh, follow up on, if you look at the, so uh, paragraph seven is, I think the only place he actually mentions the Bhikkhuni Sangha. So just going back to this idea that this paragraph has somehow been altered or I don't know, even the sutta in general has been doctored up. Um, it's quite clear in the context, from the context that he's not, he's clearly not talking about things that have only happened in the past, especially in paragraph eight, when he starts talking about future times. So it's pretty specious reasoning to suggest that just because the Buddha mentions the bhikkhunis here, he also mentions his parinibbana or the, the Buddha's Parinibbana, which of course hasn't happened yet. And then he again makes mention of in future times. So there's really no basis to talk about the mention of Bhikkhuni Sangha being problematic. You know, just thought I'd point that out. There are, Ananda, four kinds of purification of offering. What for? There is the offering that is purified by the giver, not by the receiver. Uh, no 1303 ma here the word purified has the meaning made fruitful sorry what ma stands for majima atagata is the commentary to the majima nikaya oh, okay thank you there is the offering that is purified by the receiver not by the giver there is the offering that is purified neither by the giver nor by the receiver there is the offering that is purified both by the giver and by the receiver. And how is the offering purified by the giver, not by the receiver? 
Here the giver is virtuous, of good character, and the receiver is immoral, of evil character. Thus the offering is purified by the giver, not by the receiver. And how is the offering purified by the receiver, not by the giver? Here the giver is immoral, of evil character, and the receiver is virtuous, of good character. Thus the offering is purified by the receiver, not by the giver. And how is the offering purified neither by the giver nor by the receiver? Here the giver is immoral of evil character and the receiver is immoral of evil character. Thus the offer is purified neither, neither by the giver nor by the receiver. And how is the offering purified both by the giver and by the receiver? Here the giver is virtuous of good character and the receiver is virtuous of good character. Thus the offering is purified both by the giver and by the receiver. These are the four kinds of purification of offering. I have a question here. So the person with uh, this uh, immoral and uh, evil character, will like, such person will really have a volition to give? You can give for the wrong reasons, for sure. But they're likely not giving. Yeah, that would reasons. not be a giving. That would be a, some sort of trade, then, right? Well, no, but you can give for how it makes you look. No, people like a, a there are corporate entities that make donations to make themselves look good, or you know, people do right. that as well. But that that's not a giving. That's not a like what uh, uh, honor means, right? It is, that's a... it is technically giving. You're, you're giving something, but uh, because of your immorality, you might be manipulative. Like you remind people all the time about the fact that you gave, or you're proud of your giving, that sort of thing. I mean, uh, Robin Hood. You steal from other people and <laughs> to give to the poor, so you are immoral. No, no, that's that, 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 that's exactly my point. That's uh, basically the, the Robin. Uh, there is not a volition of giving. That's not a giving. That's a, no. I'm. Yeah, it is giving, but but that's, I think more to the more to the point here is more likely what's being referred to here is suppose someone is immoral. They kill. They steal. They lie. They cheat. They take drugs and alcohol. But then they maybe see the Buddha, and they do something good. But because of their corruption, it's not very powerful because their mind, their intention isn't very strong. They're not very confident. They're maybe unsure about giving. And the same goes with the receiver, of course. If a person is immoral and corrupt, then well, they're not going to make it a better gift. Their attitude might corrupt it as well. They, they might uh, say things or react in such a way that doesn't bring confidence and happiness to the giver. The example is uh, King Ajata Sattu. So he, he killed his uh, father, but after that he did a lot of good deeds. So a lot of good deeds. Even though he, yeah, we owe a lot to Ajata Sattu, even even with all the horrific things he did. That is what the blessed one said. When the sublime one had said that, the teacher said further, "When a virtuous person to an immoral person gives." With trusting heart, a gift righteously obtained, placing faith that the fruit of action is great. The giver's virtue purifies the offering. When an immoral person to a virtuous person gives, with untrusting heart, a gift unrighteously obtained, nor places faith that the fruit of action is great, the receiver's virtue purifies the offering. When an immoral person to an immoral person gives, with untrusting heart, a gift unrighteously obtained, nor places faith that the fruit of that the fruit of action is great, neither virtue purifies the offering. When a virtuous per when a virtuous person to a virtuous person gives with trusting heart. A gift righteously obtained, placing faith that the fruit of action is great. That gift, I say, will come to full fruition. When a passionless person to a passionless person gives, with trusting heart, a gift righteously obtained, placing faith that the fruit of action is great. That gift, I say, 
is the best of worldly gifts. Note 1304. This last verse refers to the gift one Arahant gives to another Arahant. Although the Arahant believes in the fruit of Kama because he is without desire and lust for existence, his own act of giving is not productive of any fruits. It is a mere functional action, Kiriya, that leaves no traces behind. Sadhu. 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 One thing to remember with the, with the suttas that I mentioned multiple times is, again, these were given as practical, um, uh, they were given to an audience with intention towards that audience. And the intention of teaching this is not to lay down a textbook, not to write a textbook. The Buddha didn't write these as a textbook. He spoke them to an audience uh, mainly, well, usually mainly, to support the enlightenment of the individual listening. And so rather than rather than immediately look at this as being something that the Buddha is teaching us, that uh, we should first of all, uh, the, the idea that we should first of all see giving as a very important teaching. I mean, it's never explicitly stated that that is the case. And secondly, that this is the textbook behind giving, or that these are our doctrines set in stone. If you notice, especially with this, these verses, but throughout the sutta, the, the underlying intention is to show or to uh, describe to the audience how important intention is, how important purity is. So you have to kind of read between the lines, I think, to, to see what the important uh, value is of this sutta and why it was taught in this way and what was the intention, the reasoning, was to move away again from persons but also from concepts and help to, to appreciate the importance of purity of mind, the importance of goodness and righteousness. So I think it's more a using a gift, like this was all started by an actual gift, using it as a means of teaching something deeper about goodness and purity and reality. I have another point that goes back to talking about the question of those on the path to one of the uh, one of the fruitions. He translates it as entered upon the way. And that's not what the problem is. This word patipanna, patipanna is often translated like this, and I'm not quite sure how they get that. So panna means or apana pati patipanna. The panna could mean attain, obtain, sorry, attained. But patipanna means practice. It's this word that we always translate as practice. In in Thailand, it's a Thai word. They say patibat. You tell someone to go practice, you say patibat. Go practice very very clear and simple so rather than one who has entered upon the path it it's a very terse statement that says one who is practicing for the fruit of that path quite simple right? so that that may be some reason some part of why there's a confusion about it sounds like someone has entered upon something particularly and that's not what it says that's patipanna which simply means practicing it's a very simple word. There is another word, the uh, seka, right? The uh, in training that is often used. So there is a question in the chat. Moira asks, since we can't really know uh, other people's level of attainment, shouldn't we just practice giving indiscriminately? Because being generous is good for us. You shouldn't give indiscriminately. You should give where you have, the Buddha said in another place, you should give where you have confidence that it's going to be of benefit. Uh, but yeah, the fruit will be affected by the quality of the recipient, the quality of your mind, the Buddha says here, right? The quality of the gift, the gift he doesn't mention here, but the, the type of gift that you give can have an effect. But more importantly, it's none of these things at all. It's the state of mind. It's the experience. It's not the people or the thing. It's your state of mind, which is going to be affected by all these things. 
just, again, rather than taking this, oh, this is what we should all do, try and understand what is the important importance, why the Buddha is clarifying these things is because of the reality behind them is often different from how we perceive them. So the, making a rule that you should just give indiscriminately is, is missing the point of how important your intentions, or not your intentions, your state of mind is in in everything you do and how that can be, how that state of mind can be easily manipulated by lots of factors. So according to the uh, Dana Sutta, even if you give with the thought giving is good, that is also not the uh, most fruitful way of uh, giving. At least uh, several ways of giving with several types of intentions and thoughts. That is still not the best way. The yeah, best like way with is... that one and with this one, important to remember is that these are in the context of the greater teachings of reality, of experience and defilements and so on. So giving these teachings is often to an audience that isn't ready to understand or appreciate the deeper teachings. And so it's a means of pointing out that um, th these ideas like giving is good and so on are, are tied to results based on the state of mind that they evoke are going to be of limited benefit because of the, the attachment to ideas and concepts. Uh, can, we, can we make a definition or have a definition for a gift? What, what is a gift then? A thing you give to someone else. It can be arms, it can be something, some device. When we practice uh, metta meditation, is also considered to be a gift, an offer? No, no. No, I mean, you could, you could, I mean, they're just words, right? You can use the word to talk about it as a gift, but you're not actually giving anything unless I... you think of it as giving encouragement. We use the word in that sense, give encouragement. But the gift has to have a recipient. It, uh, so you can't give anything to a Buddha image. It's not given if you give something to a Buddha image. But for example, you. like meditation, you might say, you know, like the effort that I done that can be beneficial to everyone around you. You're actually right. There, is, there. It, it, in fact, you're right in that it is. I mean, again, they're just words, so it is actually referred to. It's not a gift technically, but it's a gift in another way. It is. It's actually referred to as. Um, Patidana, dana, it is referred to as dana, giving, but it's giving a, a share of the goodness that you gain. You, you wish for others to benefit from it as well. But it's just a figurative, it's just a figure of speech, not actually giving anything. In a way, you're sort of committing yourself to uh, helping others based on the goodness that you've gained. You're allowing others uh, an opportunity to rejoice. Like if I say, I gave this and I gave it on your behalf, then you can feel happy as well. And because you feel happy about it, that's also goodness. Patanumodana, you appreciate the gift because I, I included you in it. Or not just a gift, but our practice, when you practice meditation and you dedicate it to others, it's, others can appreciate it and that's good for them. It's also wholesome for your mind when you're kind and generous. And it's, it involves the determination to help others with what you've gained through the practice, that sort of thing. There's another kind of gift called abhayadana, which means freedom from fear, the gift of freedom from fear. So the, the word is used, that, that refers to one who keeps the precepts, that they don't kill or steal, so they give freedom from fear. Nobody has to be afraid because they, they're keeping the precepts. So you say give, but it's not actually, it's not technically a gift, but in a way it is a very valuable gift. But uh, abhayadana, you can also go and uh, release uh cattle or cows uh, who are thought to be slaughtered, that is also a bedana, right? I, yeah, I, I remember that, but that's not how I understand it from the text. That's not how I remember it. Anyway, there, let's say there's two there's two ways you can give people, you can give beings their freedom, and that's what I hear a lot of people calling the bayadana, but it's another one where if you don't kill, you've given freedom to all beings, freedom from fear. I'm not sure which one is actually canonical a bayadana, but... I do know the one you mentioned. There are clearly two, two, just two different ways of what you might call giving. You can give someone their freedom and uh, giving freedom, but you can release 
animals, but you can also give freedom by just abstaining from killing. That that would be like uh, more like charitta sila instead of varitta sila. So a uh, second precept, uh, another example would be like second precept, like you are not stealing somebody's uh, uh, stuff, but that is different from actually giving offering dana to a monk. Yeah, but it can still be called giving. You, you've given them freedom. Nobody has to fear you. I was just meant to say that there are different things that are called giving that aren't actually technically a gift. So regarding the personal gifts, uh, there is an interesting question answered by the commentaries. The question is, uh, uh, the Buddha giving a gift uh, to Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Sariputta giving a gift to the Buddha, which is more uh, fruitful, which is greater? Anybody knows the answer? I'm sure Bhante knows. I don't know if it's a trick question. I would probably say the gift to the Buddha. I would, I would say neither, yeah. I guess you could say the it gift is. to the gift to Sariputta is better because the Buddha is more adept at giving. I don't know. Both arahants, right? It's the very last uh, verse it's applying to them, right? Yeah, both both arahants, but uh, there's a big difference. Yeah, of course. So uh, 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 going back to what we were saying about ahead, Abhayadana, the commentary says Tata Hingsa Niwat the uh, Sambhasatanang Abhayadana. This is so. This is where I got this from. So I think it is canonical the way I mentioned it. One gives Abhayadana to all beings through refraining from violence. So th this, I think, it is actually later a later idea where you talk about Abhayadana as freeing animals. It may be in the text, but it may also just be a later interpretation of this idea. I think the original one was when you keep the precepts. That's considered Abhayadana. Abhayadana. Yeah, I have heard that one too, Bhante, like uh, not keeping to the, uh, refraining from killing is giving things Abhayadana. So the answer to the question is that uh, uh, what makes uh, uh, giving more important, it is the quality of wisdom, right? So a Buddha giving a gift, a Buddha's wisdom is much greater than uh, the wisdom of Venerable Sariputta. So, the, uh, the Buddha knows the uh, more about giving. So Buddha's wisdom makes the, that act greater than whenever Sariputta giving a gift to the Buddha. So that is how the commentary, uh, I think, resolves that matter. Isn't this think like a ranking? The, ranking is based on you, like uh, the, the the merits. No, in, in think that of case, the, the results. What, what would be the result of the Buddha doing something? Versus what would be the result of Sariputta doing something? That's the best way of looking at it. Anything the Buddha does is, is always going to be incomparable. And his right. reasoning and his understanding of why to do it. And the, therefore the results are going to be superior. That makes sense. doesn't matter about giving or, or speaking or anything. You switch from giving a gift to speaking. When the Buddha says something, is it going to be better than when Sariputta says something? Most likely, Buddha, obviously. That's the whole point. It's a good question because it, it helps point out how how uh, not to take this too literally or get too caught up in categorizing or, or pigeonholing things and understand what is the meaning behind this. Because one glaring obvious problem with this sutta is um, it's never going to be so simple. Giving, you could say, giving in to this person or that person is better, but no, it's not. Not always. It's always going to depend on the circumstances, right? It's always going to depend on the state of mind. And giving to the same person twice could be very different depending on your state of mind. Yeah, and also if you give uh, like a whiskey bottle to a monkey, <laughs> it's not going to be fruitful, even though the monkey is uh, very. Just... Or you can give something which is very important to you versus giving something that you don't care about, for example. Yeah, that gets into the importance of giving in terms of helping you let go. Challenging yourself to give things that are hard to give, it can be valuable. It can be. It's, again, finding, trying to, we try, we try to always find rules and it makes our life easier to just know that this is what I should do or that is what I should do. But it's misguided because only mindfulness 
and clarity of the situation will tell you what to do in that particular situation. And clinging to rules or ideas of what you should do, you can you can hold on to them, uh, practically speaking. But you have to have a deeper under to to really be find peace and happiness and freedom from suffering. You have to have a deeper sense of uh, the nature of reality. What's actually the nature of this situation? Also, there. I mean, I think there is a very uh, big importance of like if the person wants to give it uh, freely and um, it's not pressured by anyone else to you know to to give it um some, sometimes to me like uh, the prompted uh, prom even even prompting someone to give is uh, weird but but especially like I mean, sometimes here we read the suttas and so on, um, and maybe like that inspires someone to give. But uh, but uh, some people are just very really just pressured into giving it, giving something. And that's I think it's not valuable. Well, you say it's not as valuable. It can be. As I, I, I just caution in in making any kind of bold statement like you obviously there's something in what you're saying but be clear that it's it's dependent uh, on the situation and just because prompting is a different kind of goodness than unprompting doesn't necessarily make one inferior or superior to the other generally speaking there's something noble about un being unprompted but sometimes prompting is is very important to make the to reaffirm one's uh appreciation of the rightness like if if you're being told to do something then that can make you really confident in it okay i'm not the only one who thinks i should do this or i'm doing this and wise people think it's right to do as well that sort of thing um and uh, a question also about giving i've sort of noticed in my experience of giving um sometimes there's well i think all my experiences of giving has some conceit of you know Oh, look at me! At in in some moments, and then um, at some moments, you know, whether it's within a minute of me giving it, you know, what two seconds maybe, or but sometimes it's overwhelming, and I sort of make a judgment not to do it because it seems um, like the um, you know, the intention is not correct. Correct. So my question really is: is um, is it more skillful to just give it, even though like it's overwhelming me, like seems a bit unwholesome. Just but just to gain the skill of giving, or is is it quite wise to sort of just make that judgment as as I see fit? Well, the goal that you have to think of is just giving as a matter of course. An arahant has no attachment to anything and is quite free with their possessions. They they have no attachment, so they're okay with giving away uh, pretty much anything. I mean, when it's appropriate, if if they need it more, they'll just say no because well, I can't do without that. But they have no qualms, and so all of these qualms that we have, or the reactions, or the the wrinkles in our ability to give that make it not a smooth and easy transaction or a smooth and easy action, are are the whole point of of our practice in the first place. So it's a valuable practice to to pay attention to that at any rate. And the point is that you're always going to be presented with op with opportunities to give. It's not the only thing we do, of course, but throughout your life there's going to constantly be these opportunities to give and how we respond to that or or why we refuse it is really the important question because an arahant ultimately is able to give up everything pretty much. I mean, they're able to, they, they, they don't have any attachment to anything. And so when we notice that we're clinging to things because of attachments, or when even when we do give, we're reluctant, or we have uh, attachments to it, or that sort of thing, this is, uh, the, the most important is just to pay attention to that. Because it's not a question of whether you shouldn't give. When the opportunity to give comes, you generally should, if there's uh, no reason, no valid reason not to. Uh, and all the rest is just our defilements that you have to learn to overcome. Yeah. You're choosing choosing not to give is not reasonable. It's not valuable. It's not helpful. Yeah. Usually out of dinginess or clinging to the object or that sort of thing. Giving should really be in many in 
cases or many cases, just a matter of course. If one asks for something, you have to find a reason not to give it, or the opportunity comes to support someone. For example, you see a beggar on the street or a monk on alms round or that sort of thing. You have to find a reason not to. It's kind of not really a, okay. a, the way of enlightened beings to go out of their way to give. That's important to note as well. Uh, if, if you have a lot of wealth, then I think you could take that as an impetus to go out of your way to give. Because you have excess wealth, then you're presented with the question of what to do with it. Uh, giving is one of the best things to do with it. Really, the best thing to do with excess wealth is just to give it. It's a real investment in your future. So, yeah, thank you for that, Bhante. So, I've also noticed from my experiences, there's certain times where I'm, I'm seeking out giving um, uh, sort of, sort of, just not like from knowing that it's a good thing, going out of my way to try give, and it, it, like when I look at it, it is a bit uncomfortable. It's not, it doesn't feel um, smooth or, or natural. Yeah, you should try to. Well, I mean, you're learning how it get natural, but the point is, or an important point is, not to cling to ideas like I should be giving more, yeah. right, or that sort of thing. Um, you should give. Giving should be a natural part of your life. That's what you want to aim for. But the, regarding the what a monk can give to lay people, uh, can we say that giving the opportunity to ordination or giving ordination or be a preceptor of someone uh, could be, can we say that that's the, one of the highest giving a monk can give? Well, yeah, giving the Dhamma is, is also considered a gift. So I, I'm just, I was trying to be a little bit, I guess, pedantic or technical that there's a specific usage of the word gift that can't apply to things like teaching or giving ordination or uh, many of the things that we call giving gifts like like that. But, uh, you know, they are, they are also, you can call them gifts. Dhamma Dhamma is known as the highest giving. Dhamma Dante, why there is an expectation of repayment introduced in paragraph six? Shouldn't we um shouldn't we offer offerings without expecting anything in return? Not necessarily. I mean, there's there really isn't a lot of should here, except what he says to his uh, his aunt. But the, the 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 details of the sutta, it's more just describing a difference. Uh, but there's another sutta that Sanka mentioned that does talk about such things as your intention for giving, and uh, that would be interesting to read. It talks about even where the intentions lead you. I think the the implication of the highest one is when you give, it should be. Uh, as a support for the mind. I don't even think the Buddha says that is the highest, but that the implication at least is there that that is the highest. Uh, do, do we want to read that? We have the link from Sanka, but it's a strang- translation from Tani Sarabiku. No, we're almost out of time. Mm-hmm. With uh, being offered blessings, sometimes when we offer dana, we're offered blessings. Other times we're not. Um, I was wondering... Is there, um, I don't know what the word is, but is there like more, is it, is there power behind that blessing or is that true or that's, it's another concept? There can be uh, power behind the quality of mind of the person as they're listening to it. And there can be positive and negative to it. The whole blessing thing is kind of funny because Buddhists, the, the bhikkhus didn't give blessings to people when they went on alms round and they were criticized for it. And then the Buddha allowed them, the Buddha, they went to the Buddha and they said, look, what happened is this other group of recklesses started saying, ah, these Sakyans, they just, they're just silent. You know, they gave the gift and they're not grateful. They receive a gift and they're not grateful. They just go on their way without saying anything. And then, uh, so the, they went to the Buddha and the Buddha said, yeah, go ahead. And so they started giving giving blessings or, or may you be happy or that sort of thing. And another group of ascetics said, oh, look at these these Sakyans ingratiating themselves with others. Uh, why are they speaking out? They should be more 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 like reckless, more reclusive, more focused on the goal rather than focused on trying to ingratiate themselves into in others good grace and then they so the monks went back to the buddha and told them this and the buddha said look it's not by staying silent and it's not by speaking up that one is uh, one is 
doing the right thing. So I mean, that's from the other side of it, of whether one should give a blessing or not. But that's maybe some insight into why sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. There are monks who say a recent sort of thing in Thailand where they refuse to give blessings on alms round because they say it breaks certain rules to do so. But I think they're, they they kind of, I've read this in Thai, this, uh, this reasoning, and they're kind of um, fudging things because it's not so much that the blessing is a problem. The problem is if the person, and they mentioned this, if the person is sitting down, and this is a problem in uh, some cultures, Lao culture especially, they sit down, they kneel down when it gives a blessing standing up. And technically the monk can't teach the Dhamma to someone who is sitting when they're standing. Now they're, they're, these people are kneeling in, on their knees with their hands up, so it's not really sitting, but technically it's right. They, they should be standing up. So when you give a gift, don't sit down while the monk is standing. Technically that's not cool. Um, but it's more related to, to giving the blessing. And so they say you just never give a blessing to people on Amsterdam. But the point is that the blessing is not really... Some people would say, you, know, you already got the blessing. The blessing is from the gift itself. You giving is the blessing. So yeah, it's much more of a modern sort of cultural or uh, Buddhist culture, cultural practice that arose. I think it's valuable and profit, generally good, especially for people who aren't maybe so deep in the practice and don't have such a strength where they can let go. It helps them to cling to to the monk's words and cling to the hope of a good future, that sort of thing. And it can be mildly beneficial. I wouldn't put too oh, much stock in it, but it can create it can create attachments as well. Attachments to the future, attachments to pleasant feelings and so on. And also when you give a blessing, uh, the lay person, when the monks give a blessing, the lay person uh, becomes happy because he knows that the monk is happy with what? Uh, he received and you didn't do anything wrong yeah did yeah it, it, it's a reminder that what you did was a good thing it's a reassurance that, that that's a big part of it for sure so it can be valuable again especially when there's not that reassurance but uh, over the long term requiring it from outside sources is, is going to be a crutch and if you cling to that it's not going to help you develop the confidence in what you're doing but that's the thing is mostly giving is to people who are mostly giving is from people who aren't very strong in the practice so giving blessings can be a, a reasonable thing to do a good way of yeah. smoothing things over keeping things wholesome and so on because otherwise otherwise people will have to uh, read into the like the gesture of the mark of read facial expressions to see whether well, again, remember the sutta that we, this, the sutta that we just read. Like, that's the whole point: is don't focus on the person, don't fixate on the person. Sangha, oh. give to the sangha. Why are you Bunte. giving in the first place? Think about why you're giving. Bhante, this uh, this whole thing with the blessings and even the chantings. To me, it seems that they they all came later. It looks to me, it look they look like like just rituals, and um, I mean. And and especially comparing to the to the uh, suttas and um, stories that we hear, we 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 I don't see like a blessing or a chanting. Or, I mean these things. There's a little so. bit. I mean, there's certainly chanting as a recitation, or chanting is mostly for the purpose of remembering, remembering yes, the suttas, remembering the Buddha, the Dhamma. Sangha for veneration and so on. It's for determination. It's like a but, mantra in many cases. But but. I see that it, uh, there is a big focus now on uh, on the and on on these things, and I feel like many people um, just misunderstand that that's that's the point of all this, even giving. Or so for the giving, uh, the point of giving is oh, I'm going to receive a blessing or uh, things like that. Or let's gather together, not to not to mainly like let's just. Yeah. Eat together. I was, and I, was chant. I was scolded scolded once for not doing a specific chant. I was told that monks have to give this specific chant. It was so shocking to hear this, but this is uh, the but Sanka, I don't know if you've ever heard people say this, but they, I'm sure you noticed that monks always say Idang me Idang wo nyati nang hotu. Yeah, that that yeah. there's this idea that monks have to. They have a, 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 it's a rule. And as, mm -hmm. as though there could be a rule that monks do a specific chant, that's quite scary. Yeah, exactly. It's very, very so ritualistic. This whole, yeah. So that's, uh, for me, it's like, it's like um, 
it looks like it's uh, declining the whole value or even the wisdom part is well, declining you have to see it as as practices that are potentially conducive or gateway practices that lead people closer and so you have to always use them in that way you shouldn't discard them because it's like it's like burning a bridge or breaking a bridge i you have to use them you, as a bridge so when we went to when we went to the um, Bodhi tree in Bulgaria, uh, I thought that it's going to be like big silence and everyone will be yeah. meditating and so on. And it was just, just the most awful thing. What um, the whole, um, what's the word, um, with these speakers, right? Like they didn't even the speakers like speakers were a bit much. much. Yeah, we couldn't hear you. Um, I mean, it was just interesting. We right just beside them. But yes, yeah, so well, you have, I mean, that's, you have Buddhists from all traditions and all schools, all levels. Yeah, if you, if you uh, discard the cultural aspects, they are going to go to uh, the next uh, uh, religion, which allows <laughs> that kind of practice. Okay. If you like, yeah, go that's about... the breaking the bridge. If you tell people, no, we don't do that. If you refuse them, then they just leave or they lose faith or lose interest and so you have to use these things as bridges you don't have to you don't have to fixate on this if people leave they leave and don't waste too much energy on it but you shouldn't be cruel in terms of refusing people who monks who refuse to give blessings on alms round for example it's just uh, kind of cruel mm -hmm. yeah i guess and, i guess you, i you, understand it's so enlightening to read what the buddha said where he says yeah give blessings and then they say you shouldn't give blessings. It was like, what do you want from me? It's not because you speak or don't speak. It's that the Buddha is in all ways, you know, very open and unattached. So this fixation on, there's a, there's a lot of criticism, like you mentioned, but people are very critical sometimes. Oh, these these people aren't real Buddhists doing all this chanting and so on. There's great good in that, in, in, in what they're doing on, on a certain level. And it can be a great support. And the way you praise people can be very helpful. If you praise them in the right way and you say, yes, chanting is good because it, because, and then that's, that's the bridge, that's the gateway. It helps you and orient those people or, or lead those people in the right direction based on what they are uh, inclined towards. Help them understand why chanting could be beneficial, why blessings could be beneficial. Help them understand reality, kind of like how the Buddha does in this sutta. But Pante, what you say, there's a danger if people think there's kind of magic power to the chantings because even then there's they're not doing something wrong they're still doing something good well, that's yeah that's why you that's why you explain it in the right way is there also a thing like uh, they think that it's magical or something some people do that's through lack of proper instruction but there can be who knows according to the ratana sutta uh, oh. the chanting head to clean the... <laughs> i'm just quoting a sutta seriously <laughs> who knows yeah we don't know anything everything about uh, the effects but it's not the core of Buddhism. It's not what makes it really Cuts. valuable. And yeah, the obsession with fixation on things like the Ratana Sutta can be problematic. I once was lived, stayed with a monk in, in Colombo who every morning we had to chant it during a specific period. I don't know if it was, if you know what the period was, but every morning we would chant the Ratana Sutta or he would chant it. I tried to keep up with him, but it was very fast. Multiple times. I can't remember how many times, but each morning it was more than once long ratana is long yeah, and i think it was how many times would we chant it i can't remember every morning uh, and i saw a good question in the chat from moira who was asking what is the right way to respond to um receiving a gift from someone sometimes receiving gifts can feel awkward well the right way i think is again trying to frame it in the right frame it in the right way how you frame it for them how you how you understand it yourself and understand the, the, the good of, of it, the, the importance of it. This is, again, in the highest sense, a support for that person's mind. The person giving has provided their mind with some kind of support that will help them to become free from suffering. That's, I think, the best way to look at it. So how you respond is going to relate to that. Sometimes nothing is, no, nothing is needed. Usually it's just the conventional response which is usually to thank the person. I was thinking about the word thank, and some languages don't have that. English, we have this word, this phrase, thank you. There is no thank you in Pali. You might <laughs> say it is good. Uh, 
It is great. Yeah. You might express your joy in in their goodness. Anumodana. There's no thank you. Just trying to figure out what the word thank actually means. It's an odd word. I don't even know what the etymology of it is. So a little bit of a silly -er question. Um, so is it better to give, um, you know, just randomly for no reason, um, apparently, apparently reason, as opposed to just um, giving a gift for a birthday or someone's birthday, or it's equal? Well, giving it to birth someone's birthday is uh, it's expected, it's appreciated. It's um, it's symbolic, so symbolism can be very powerful. But it, again, it's not going to be one particular type of giving that's always more fruitful. It's going to depend very much on the situation, right? Give on the birthday. There's a lot of other qualities, a lot of other factors involved. Thank did you. the Buddha say? Did the Buddha say anything about sharing merits of our gifts or of our meditation? Like, is that real? Yes. Oh, yeah. Again, what I mentioned, I didn't translate it. Idang me nyati nang hotu. May this be for my relatives. Oh yeah, giving it's got, and uh, it's yeah. In in the dasa dasa punyakiriyavatu, one of them is uh, the means of doing goodness. One of them is patidana, which is sharing the the merits, sharing the goodness, dedicating it to others. Certainly and in the, in the you, teaching, can we share our merits? Um, with people outside of our relatives, like um, let's say our teachers, um, maybe, uh, I don't know, just other people, also people who are uh, not living or that we don't see, it's, not, not it's necessarily kind of people, but beings. I, it's related to how we give metta, so you start with those who are closest to you, you can wish for it to be a benefit to all beings. I mean, a simple one is just to say, may this be a benefit to all beings. May all beings have a share in the goodness. You can uh, share merits with uh, relatives, your dead relatives, uh, and also gods, and also all beings. It goes as Sabbe Deva Anumodantu, then Sabbe Satta. If you're dead relatives, you, you should appreciate that you're not not actually sharing it with the person, with the, with the dead person, but the person who has gone on to another place. It's not this not the old person, it's the person in their future life. You're sharing it not with a dead relative, you're sharing it with a reborn relative, let's say. Um, relative, um, are, are those like just the very immediate uh, beings that pass away? Or, I mean, I feel like we are relatives to many, many people. Well, the value of focusing on immediate relatives is the reminder of the goodness that they have done for you. The gratitude mm -hmm. you have towards them and the appreciation you have towards them. It's about reconciling any negative feelings you might have, any sadness at lose, having lost them, uh, ingratitude that you might have towards them. Yeah, so it is connected to uh, this life, not all existence in samsara. Yeah. I mean, relatives in this life again, there's something spe mm -hmm. there's a special issue there. Okay. I think it's one of the duties of uh, children to their parents. Probably mentioned in the Sigala or the Sutta. Yeah, it's the, it's the fifth uh, duty uh, towards your parents. Furthermore, I shall offer arms in honor of my departed relative. Um, in the verse, uh, there is a there is a um, word righteously obtained gift righteously obtained is it is it um, about the person who is receiving the gift uh, how did you come to buy that gift or have that gift to give away um where is that so in the second line, it's a, it's either gift righteously obtained or gift unrighteously obtained, and this alternate. Second paragraph. No, it's the last, the verse, the verse, and just the second lines in each each like verse. Immediately, my I'll look at the Pali, but my immediate assumption is it relates to uh, the re receive, like righteously received. Do you deserve it? That sort of thing. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that's. I mean, I don't even have to look, but it's pretty clear what it means. It's not the person giving, did they get the thing they were going to give righteously? Did the person who received it receive it righteously, rightfully? Mm -hmm. So that's oh, a thing. Adamena ladang, received not according to the Dhamma. Re received means obtain, right? Not they obtain, you obtain the gift to be given uh, according to the Dhamma, or not, without uh, mm -hmm. mitya jiva. But if you are immoral, then it means that 
you you receive the gift that you're not worthy of, right? No, this is the giver. Giver, giver is it obtain that gift. Uh, you didn't steal it from somebody else to give it to this person. No, 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 no. Question and answer. Yeah. Adam mena ladang. The gift is received unrighteously. It's nothing to do with the person giving it, getting it unrighteously. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it's misleading here because the word obtained is is vague. Received the gift received unrighteously. But then, Bante, the edit's question comes to play. What if the recipient is uh, immoral? So, is he still deserving of the gift? The, re the recipient is immoral. Then yeah. Not, so in this uh, then yeah, it's this Adamina, was Adam. The mind is not bright because it is. Mm. So, this first verse says when a virtuous person to an immoral person gives with trusting mm -hmm. heart a gift righteously obtained. So, yeah. in that case, uh, I would think it's talking about the person who is whether he, he obtained it righteously or not. Because if it is it's a immoral person, no, no, no. virtuous Bante, person to trusting. Okay, here we are. In the second, in the second verse, it says an immoral person to a virtuous person gives, and it's still the gift is and must be how Sanka is saying. Oh, I see what you mean. I, I get, I get the point, but I still am skeptical. Just give me a second. No. No, it doesn't say. No, it doesn't say that the person received the gift. It says the gift was received. You look at the grammar; it's quite clear. The dana is received by the dhamma. Yo silawa supasana jito. That's the point. Is the silawa who gives is supasana jito is uh, is of, of pure bright mind. Because of that, the gift danang damina ladang gift is received by the Dhamma. The English makes that not clear, but the Pali is quite clear. Yeah, the singular. Prove me, prove me right or wrong. Yeah, uh, so, okay, well, I'm looking at one singular source. It says a uh, uh, virtuous person uh, who obtain, what is obtained righteously, uh, he give with pure heart to a uh, 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 immoral person. Something like that. I mean, okay, it's just a splitting hairs. I, both are important. It's important not to receive things wrongly and then give them to someone else. But I don't think, I think it's much simpler as all. Well. Then Pali makes it pretty clear that it's quite simple. The dana is ladda. It's talking, not talking about a thing to be given. It's talking about the gift. A gift mm -hmm. is received by the Dhamma. It's a quite a simple construction. Danang damena ladang. The gift by the Dhamma is received. Or you could say obtained. Let's say it, it would translate it as the more ambiguous obtained. The gift by the Dhamma is obtained. It's still talking about a gift. Well, okay, so we obtain gifts that we're going to give, but that's not how you that's not what this means. I don't buy it. Anyway, I both are important. Don't don't steal things to give to someone else, obviously. But that's not what this is referring to, I'm quite sure. So is, yeah, is the opposite uh, true, Bante? Like, uh, is there a place where it says it's an immoral who gives trusting heart uh, without righteously, unright okay, uh, so unrighteously obtained would refer to when the person doesn't des uh, deserve it, even to a righteous person. So how could it be uh, unrighteous if the recipient is virtuous? I think it's just saying that the giving is, the giving itself is not according to the Dhamma. The gift is given by the Dhamma or the gift is not not given by the Dhamma, which relates to the qualities of both people. Yeah, I might be wrong, actually. I read it a little, again, it's unclear, isn't it? Yo do silo, silo and desu But the second line is sa da kina dayakato isu chati. It just seems like such a out of left field thing to talk about how the gift, how the thing to be given was received or was was obtained. Sorry, by the by the person who is going to give it. But now I get I get the point. Is yeah, no, I might be wrong. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Anyway, I thank you. It, it, for... it is it is valuable to talk about the things that you give being right righteously obtained. That's true. I think I could be wrong. Um, it, yeah, you know, it's it's not quite. It reminds me, Edit, um, my uh, my grandmother. She lives in a a. a what do you call that in a home, a, like a nursing home? I forget what it's called, like in a residence. Re retirement. Uh, yes, where nurses take care of them and they go and they eat uh, in a common room and 
their meals are taken care of. Um, mm-hmm. But she she does this thing where she keeps like the little um, individual butter cups. Like technically they're hers, but what she does is she collects hers. She doesn't take other people's. She collects them and then she she offers them to me as a gift. So she has like a little, uh, actually like a good size margarine container of these, these butter cups. And then she says it's a gift for me. But it feels really like like this uh, sentence there that you're talking about righteously obtained because she tells me that when I bring it home with me just to keep it hidden because she's not stealing them but then she she doesn't <laughs> want them to know that she's doing that so I feel conflicted in like should I be taking this gift or not and after this discussion I think it's not very wholesome for me to be taking it because I feel like it's not right but then at the same time, I don't want to say no to my grandmother. It's kind of awkward. Yeah. Ima- I- I- let's imagine someone steals, uh, I don't know, money or something, and then they want to give you, you know, $10,000. No, exactly. I really, wouldn't. That's not really stealing, I think. <laughs> Not for you, true. I find it's, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of like a gray, gray th- zone. Like there's another place where um I was going to uh, get a service done. And um then they told me that if I paid cash, and I mean, it's in, in a shopping mall. Um, and they said, if I pay cash, then I'm going to save because I won't need to pay the taxes. But if I pay with my credit card, I have to pay the regular price. So then I, and it kind of led me to wonder, like, should I keep, like, uh, I'm I'm like, no, I don't want to participate. I didn't tell them I didn't want to participate in that. But I'm like, oh, that's fine. I'll just pay with my card. But then I'm wondering, like, should I even be doing business with these people? Even though, like, it happens mm-hmm. in a lot of places. It's just that they developed trust in me from being a regular customer that they told me, well, there's this little inside thing. But it felt, like, kind of icky, too. I mean, you won't be breaking the bracelet. Well, well, Julia, I was listening to what you had to say. Uh, Is it right to continue? Yes, I was listening to what you had to say. So when people actually use a credit card, um, the vendor does have to pay a certain percentage to the credit card company. So they do prefer cash as opposed to paying 3 or 4% to the credit card company. That's, That's the incentive for them to ask you for cash. As for your grandmother, I I was thinking that... Yeah. Just to clarify, they did really specify the the whole like the way I explained it. It's not an interpretation. It's really the words that they used. But that's a good point that you bring about like with the the credit card company charging. Um, but it wasn't that. And then about your grandmother, I've been in that position a few times to where I go to a conference and they offer food. And uh, really, the food is just for the participants. It's not for the family. Uh, and sometimes, um, like I'll pick up a cookie because I'm going to eat a cookie, but I'll save it for later because I'm going to share it with my family. Um, I don't feel that stealing because it's not as if I'm picking up extra cookies. It's one cookies I was going to eat and I'm going to take it home to my room to share with my family. So maybe that's just the pats of butter that your grandmother would have used. I'm, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm speculating, of course. The pats of butter that your grandmother was going to eat, but she's not eating them. She's saving them for you. So maybe that's a possibility. I mean, stealing, if something is is uh, given, it can often, or, or sorry, presented, offered, there can be, there can be explicit stipulations. There can be implicit stipulations. There can be reasonable, uh, what is reasonable to be taken, what is unreasonable to be taken. It doesn't, I don't think, qualify as stealing to cross any of those lines, reasonable, unreasonable, etc. But it can be abusive, so there's leeway, and it's not breaking the precept, but it can be very unwholesome depending on the stick quality of mind of law. I would look there instead of trying to determine, did it break a precept or not? Is it unwholesome? the deeper meaning. I did find something in the commentary about this phrase, this Pali phrase, uh, I think you might be right. I think, I mean, we have the Singhala as well sitting here. Yeah, it might be actually referring to how the thing to be given was received. And again, this is poetry, so it's, it's, it's not introducing new doctrine. It's just describing ways in which 
the person who gives might be impure. Right? If they received it impurely, that's an example of why they, they're they're not going to purify the giving because they're corrupt because they stole it or something. Zen has a question in the in the chat. Is tax a theft? Tax? No, nobody's taking your taxes. They're just telling you you have to pay as part of society. It's, uh, tax is the what is owed to the government based on laws, a debt. But it uh, could be an artificial debt, right? But like, for example, if a king comes and says that you have to give 90% of your earnings to me. It seems to me that all debt is artificial. There's no such thing as ultimate debt. I mean, except in terms of debt of gratitude or debt of uh, someone's beneficence towards you. But in terms of monetary debt, it's all arbitrary. I give you this, now you owe me this much money. I mean, those prices fluctuate. It's all artificial. But if there's an it's agreement, possible. okay, I, I promise to give you this much. Well, this. that's the part thing we have uh, we have a social contract contract it's not we don't need to agree to it we're born into servitude we're born into servitude to the society it's like uh, we're born into servitude to this body we didn't agree to feed the body we didn't agree i'll be born and and i'll i'll run around chasing after food to feed you every day and i'll take care of you and we didn't agree to any of this and yet the body imposes all these things on us society is like that that's it's true. capricious that's so great an example yeah, really, I, I really have to go now thank you all for coming have a good week thank you Sadu, sadu, sadu. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Thank you, everyone.